And the government's moved extremely quickly, hasn't it, to deal with this disaster? Uh, it has. I mean, the emergency centre, as I say, was set up almost immediately. We were seeing television pictures from Chilean television of the president, Michelle Bachelet, at that emergency centre, coordinating efforts, talking to the rescue workers, trying to assess uh, the damage, and appealing for calm, giving advice to the Chilean population, uh, telling them to stay off the roads, uh, to call the emergency services if, if necessary, and to try to reassure them that everything that could possibly be done was being done uh, as quickly as possible. So, so far, yes what looks like uh, a very well coordinated rescue attempt but really we are at the very very early stages of, of simply assessing the damage and then we'll have to see uh, what, what needs to be done after that. Daniel Schweimler in Buenos Aires and the quake has had a wide impact in the region and across the Pacific. Two ships have been dispatched to Chile's remote Robinson Crusoe Island. The Chilean president says a tsunami could hit Easter Island very soon and that evacuation is underway. There is serious damage in the southern island of Juan Fernandez. Both Australia and New Zealand have issued tsunami alerts. And the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center says a tsunami could damage Hawaii and has called for urgent action to protect lives. Well, earlier I spoke to Dr. Roger Musson from the British Geological Survey in Edinburgh. He told me that this is the biggest earthquake anywhere in the world since the 2004 quake in Sumatra, which caused the devastating Boxing Day tsunami. Uh, well, an earthquake like, like this, an earthquake above magnitude 8 happens on average about once a year somewhere in the world. But this is towards the upper end of 8, so this is probably, we would not normally expect to see something like this uh, more than about once every 10 years. And in fact, this is the largest earthquake to occur anywhere in the world since the Great Sumatra earthquake of Boxing Day in 04. And what triggers an earthquake of this scale? Uh, well, what is happening here in Chile is uh, two of the Earth's crustal plates are, m are moving towards each other. Uh, the, what we call the Nazca Plate, which is the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean, is moving eastwards at a rate of about 8 centimeters a year. It then collides with the South American Plate. It's pushed underneath it, and it dips right down um, and is destroyed at great depth. And it's this interface between these two plates where they jar against each other that produces uh, earthquakes in, in Chile. And this particular type of plate boundary where you have this sort of collision is typically where you get the world's largest earthquakes. So it's no surprise really that this large earthquake has occurred here. Um, further south in Chile, is where the world's largest ever recorded earthquake happened. That was in 1960, and that was a magnitude 9.5, which was really significantly larger even than this one. I see there's a chart behind you. Are you using that to, to monitor what's going on right now? Yes, yes. This is, this is a seismogram which has been recorded by one of our instruments. This is actually one in the south of Scotland. Um, the horizontal lines represent the, 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 the movement of the recorder. Um, the earthquake actually happened at about 6.34 our time, which is here. About 15 minutes later, the first shock waves arrived at the instrument, um, and they start coming in, and the amplitude then gets much greater. So the really damaging waves are these great big green ones, enormous amplitudes. We haven't seen anything like this really since the Sumatran earthquake. And the shock waves are still coming in, so here's, here's, here's noon. And there's the still a slow movement here as the slowest moving waves are traveling up from Chile and arriving in Scotland. And that was Dr. Roger Musson talking to me a short while ago. And people from the region have been emailing the BBC with their reaction. Here are some of the messages we've received. Nicholas in Santiago writes, The buildings seem to be dancing in the air when the earthquake happened. I've driven through the old part of town and there are some collapsed bridges. Louise in Santiago says, I was with my family and felt the whole house move around. At one stage, I thought the second floor was going to collapse. The bridges are now unstable, which means driving around the city is very dangerous. And keep those comments coming in to us here at BBC World News. Well, for the latest on what's happening in Hawaii, I'm joined on the line now by Dan Nakasso, who's reporter and editor for the Honolulu Advertiser. And Dan, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center has called for urgent action to be taken to protect lives and property in Hawaii. What's being done to ensure that happens? 
Well, in a little less than two hours, they're going to sound sirens all across the Hawaiian Islands. That'll be 6 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time. That's uh, uh, a pretty unusual step here. Uh, we've had the last warning we had was in way back in 1994. Uh, what that means is, uh, in, uh, after the alarm sound at 6 a.m. Uh, at uh, approximately five hours later, at 11:19 on the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, a wave that's currently estimated to be two meters high is expected to hit. And of course, uh, the Big Island's been hit with some uh, disastrous tsunamis uh, back in the 20th century. Uh, that killed lots of people. Uh, it's supposed to then the wave is then supposed to hit uh, Honolulu uh, on the island of Oahu at 11:25 a.m. And what's the mood like in Hawaii? Are people pretty calm about this? Are they prepared for for what they're expecting? Well, frankly, it's uh, just after 4 a.m. here, and, and uh, most people are asleep. Uh, all, but all the TV stations have uh, brought in their anchors, and uh, we're certainly geared up here at the newspaper, uh, posting several stories online. The um, uh, ships are, are being sent back out to sea. People are, are being encouraged not to panic, to stay off the roads, so that those are, that live in what we call uh, tsunami inundation zones are able to uh, safely evacuate. The idea is that the, the alarm sound at 6 a.m. and the, it supposedly gives people enough time, five hours, to, uh, to make the necessary precautions. And this warning is pretty severe, it's saying no coast of Hawaii or the Hawaiian Islands is safe. I mean, people shouldn't take uh, any comfort from being on a different side of the island. Everyone should be uh, involved in this uh, in effort to, to protect themselves. That's right. There's, there, it, depending on where the uh, earthquakes hit, uh, uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're right that, that, that any particular uh, uh, part of the coast is, is safe. There's a, um, a phenomenon known as a wraparound effect in which the, the waves will actually go around in I, uh, parts of an island and, and hit on different sides. Dan Nicasso, thank you very much for that. Emergency workers in Chile have been struggling to deal with the devastation wrought by one of the most powerful quakes ever recorded. More than 300 people are now known to have died so far. Chile's president, Michelle Bachelet, says two million people have been affected overall. The quake triggered a tsunami that pounded Chile's coastal communities. As it radiated across the Pacific, Japan ordered tens of thousands of people to leave their homes. In a moment, we'll be hearing the latest from our correspondent in Tokyo. But first, this report from Alex Kroger. The most powerful earthquake in recent memory has left its mark on Chile. Its epicenter lies about 100 kilometers offshore from the city of Concepcion. Rescue workers have struggled to get through. Some roads have been damaged, others blocked by debris. The president has declared parts of the country an emergency zone. I want to tell people to remain calm. An earthquake is part of nature. We want to call for calm and patience. And I want to assure you that the rescue teams are working. A bridge in the town of Male collapsed. Chile has a history of earthquakes. The authorities have made preparations to cope, but nothing could have prevented this. Blind chance determined who survived and who did not. Some tried to rescue relatives, but only narrowly escaped themselves. I was trying to save him when a painting fell off the wall and hit me in the back. I was somehow able to get out through a small opening in the rubble, and from there, rescue workers helped me escape. Much of the coastal town of Dechato has been destroyed. Debris floats on the water. The earthquake set off tsunami warnings across the Pacific, but most were lifted within hours. Only Chile has borne the brunt. Alex Kruger, BBC News. Well, for the latest from Chile, I spoke to our correspondent, Candice Piet. She found a scene of devastation when she arrived in the Chilean capital, Santiago. The main uh, international airport um, uh, outside the city has been damaged, the terminal and also the control tower. So there have been a lot of planes diverted and, 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 and many tourists and many travelers stranded here. Uh, so we, we made our, our way um, over the Andes from the Argentine side. Um, and as we came down the mountains, there were aftershock after aftershock, very small ones, nothing to too worrying, but certainly as we, as we came down um, the Andes into the valley where Santiago lies, 
um, you could see some of the damage that had taken place. Um, the city itself is very quiet. The, the, the streets, many of the highways had been blocked off and, and damaged in, in, in the earthquake. Um, uh, sort of pedestrian walkways over the, over the, the, the highways had, had collapsed onto the, onto the main, um, main road. And um, the city itself is, is very, is, it, was, it was dark, many parts of it are dark, um, no electricity, water supplies have been cut, and also communications. I'm not saying the whole city has been damaged in that way, but certainly in patches. And this is really the picture across Chile, very severe infrastructure damage. In terms of the mood of people there, how have they reacted to this? I presume there would be an immense sense of shock. Absolutely. I mean, this is an earthquake country. Chileans are used to earthquakes, um, an earthquake, earthquake zone, rather. But um, what we found is a full moon. It's quite warm. And a lot of people have decided to have chosen this second night um, uh, after the earthquake to sleep outside. Um, when we came into the hotel, there were people in the reception area who were just preferring to bed down on, on sofas in the lobby area rather than deal with the, the, the fear of, of being trapped in, a, in, another, in another severe quake. Candice Piet there in the capital, Santiago. Well, the earthquake triggered a tsunami that has been sweeping across the Pacific Ocean towards Asia. Japan has ordered tens of thousands of people to leave their homes after the Japanese weather agency estimated the waves of three meters or more could hit the northern coast. We're live now to Tokyo and our correspondent Roland Berg. Roland, in fact, in the last half hour or so, we've had reports that those uh, waves are almost reaching some four or five feet have indeed reached the Pacific coast in Japan. Yes, that's right. Uh, what's been happening is in the far north of the country, uh, in one port city, uh, the water has been uh, measured, uh, the tsunami has been measured at uh, more than a metre in height, uh, enough to flood quayside warehouses in that port uh, about knee deep. But uh, still the fear in Japan is of uh, worse to come. So far, uh, most of the waves have been uh, a metre, a metre twenty or less. Uh, but the fear and the warning that's still in place from the Japanese government uh, is of possible tsunamis of more than three metres uh, in height. A, a pretty large evacuation plan has been put into place across the Pacific seaboard of Japan. Uh, local media are reporting that 320,000 people have been affected by that. Uh, and also coastal train services have been suspended, roads have been shut, uh, and across the entrances to many fishing ports, steel gates have been put in place to limit the damage if the waves become bigger. Roland, in your opinion, how well equipped are they in some of these hot spot areas, if you like, to deal with this? Well, uh, Japan is uh, one of the most seismically active countries in the world, and I think uh, you'd struggle to find uh, another country uh, in the world that is uh, as well prepared as Japan. Uh, much of the coastline has, in fact, been uh, concreted over in Japan. There are protective barriers uh, across much of it, on rivers as well, for just such uh, an incident as this. Uh, it's not only uh, from across the Pacific, half a world away, that can, tsunamis can strike, but also when there are earthquakes here. Uh, but people in Japan do have reason to be cautious about this one. In 1960, an earthquake in Chile triggered a tsunami that swept all the way across the Pacific and killed around 140 people here. And Japan's Prime Minister, Yukio Hatoyama, is urging people here to keep their guard up. Okay, Roland, for now, thank you very much. Roland, but there are correspondent in Tokyo who will, of course, be live with him if there is any further developments on that. Well, earlier I spoke to Chile's ambassador to the UK, Rafael Moreno. He explained why the death toll was not as high as it could have been.